It's Sunday morning and our subject is predestination. How's that for saying it loud and clear? People say, I don't like that subject. Well, then you don't believe God if you don't like that subject. The Bible says in Romans 8 and 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. The next verse, verse 30, Moreover whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Why do I believe it? Because it's in the Bible. <clears throat> it's in the Bible. <clears throat> we did not choose God. Man has no ability to choose God. The Scripture tells us over in Psalm 65 and 4, Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee. We don't choose God and we don't cause ourselves to approach to God that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house even of thy holy temple. We do not choose God. John 15 and 16, Jesus says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and I've ordained you that you should go and bring... Now, he's chosen us to bring forth much fruit. That's John 15, 16. And then 2 Thessalonians 2.13 says, We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. We didn't choose Him. He chose us. He's chosen you to salvation, but there's a method through sanctification of the Spirit Sanctification of the Spirit, of Spirit, and belief. Now this is the method that He chose us to come in. And belief of the truth. Now, God has sanctified a people, the whom's. The whom's he did foreknow. The whom's for whom he did foreknow. Romans 8, 29. And everybody wants that chapter to read. For what God foreknew. It doesn't say what. A what is a, a what is a neuter gender. That means it's not male, it's not female. It's a table, it's a piano. It is a book, it is a... It's a pen. It's a neuter gender. The Bible doesn't say for what God foreknew. It says for whom he did foreknow. Hus is the word in the Greek text. There's an H sound. It's that little diacritical mark. Hus is masculine gender. It's a person. For whom he did foreknow. For being a subordinate conjunction points back to Romans 8 and 28. And we know, and is a coordinating conjunction, and that ties to the previous verses, the groaning, the groaning, and the going through the trials, and we know that all things, all things work together for good. Not to everybody in the world. My cardiologist said one day, I was preaching to him about predestination, he said, I thought God was a benevolent God. I said, not to everybody. Absolutely not to everybody. Do you think uh, when God puts Bill Gates into hell, that's going to be good? That ain't good. Do you think when God gave Bill Gates $68 billion, that was good? He's got $68 billion that is impossible to repent of. You know what Bill Gates has actually got? He's got a million dollars... 
times. You can't even make a million dollars one time, and he's done it 68,000 times. And that's more money than a man can repent of, isn't it? You can't repent of that. That's too much. Well, if God wants him, he'll get him. Yeah, and he'll give it all away if God wants him. Or God will have to break his neck. Or God will have to do something severe to him to cause him to bow to him and take his cross and die daily. So, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Well, and then you go into the next verse, for whom? Whom is a pronoun. Every pronoun has to have an antecedent. The antecedent is the noun or the pronoun that this pronoun refers back to them in the previous verse. It's talking about them that love God, them who are the called, for whom? When he says for, being a subordinate conjunction, subordinate, subordinate. Subordinate means to be obedient to, to obey. This pronoun has to obey the previous, and it has to carry the same gender as the pronouns it refers back to it. I've said it a thousand times. If I say, Jim went to the store, it bought a loaf of bread. You can't have, Jim is not an it. Like I said, don't call your wife an it. If you do, you're going to be sleeping out in the garage. She's not an it. Jim went to the store. He bought a loaf of bread. So whom has to have the same, the same gender as them? The whom's are a masculine gender. It is a people. It's referring back to Romans 8 and 28. And we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God. Well, does that mean you love God because you own a Bible? No. That word love is the word agape. Agape. you got two words in the Greek. Agape and phileo. Both of these have been ambiguously. That means a very shaded meaning. It have a dual meaning. Both of these have been translated, translated over in the English Bible, L-O-V-E. They don't even mean the same. Phileo means, it means affection. In agape, that is a word that is a relationship that fathers had for their children, kings had for their subjects. They gave them laws and they willingly walked in them. Second John 6, this is love. This is agape. This is what agape is. This is love and the word is agape. You're going to have a... You're going to have a textual definition that's just as strong as the Greek word. And this is probably the best definition for agape you can find in all of the Scripture and all the definitions. God Himself says, This is love that we walk after His commandments. So everywhere you find agape, you can just put walking in the commandments of God. Whenever the Bible says, love your neighbor, love your enemy, God is love, it is never the word phileo, like them. Have affection for them. It is always agape, walk in God's commandments concerning your neighbor, concerning your enemy. Always. Well, does that mean walk in all the commandments of the Old Testament? Yes. But does that mean anything else? Well, certainly it does. All the imperative moods in the New Testament, you say, Jim, I don't know what an imperative is. That's a command. It's a command. I've said it a thousand times, and I'll say it again. There, I learned this in about the ninth grade, about 1953, somewhere around there. I don't know when. Well, one, two, three, four. My teacher said there are four kinds of sentences. There's a statement that ends in a period. 
statement. It's called a declarative or a declaration. And then you have an exclamation. Exclamation ends in an exclamation point. Uh, a statement would be, Jim went to the store. Exclamation would say, Jim went to the store and I didn't even ask him to. And Mary would say that. And then, did Jim go to the store? That is an interrogative or a question. Interrogative. And then you have... And then you have an imperative. Jim, go to the store and get some sugar and some bread and stuff. Now, so when Mary says that, I have to do that. That's an imperative. It's imperative. Anytime you have an imperative mood, that's a command. So that would be included in walking in the commandments of God. You say, I don't know those imperatives. You're not going to know them. You may not know them in the Greek, but they will be going on in your heart. Won't they? When Jesus, a verse that I struggled with when I was a kid, my father being an old country Baptist preacher, he didn't know anything about the Bible. And he'd read Luke, uh, Luke 13, 24. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. And he never would try to explain it because he had no idea what strive meant. None. And all the Baptist preachers avoided that word because they thought that meant to try to enter in at the straight gate. It's not what it means. It's the Greek word agonizomai, A-G-O-N-I-Z-O-M-A-I. And the agon, that was, there's a picture of the agon on the wall over there. That's where they wrestle with the, the gladiators, I started to say alligators, with the gladiators, and, they'd, and they would fight the lions and the bears, and they'd feed them, feed the Christians to them, and that meant to agonize. It's our word to agonize. It's an imperative mood and everyone who belongs to God, when He commands, and He says, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. It's not, would you like to hear this? Let him hear is third person singular. Now hear this. That's not an invitation. It's a command. When He would say, humble yourselves under the hand of God. Humble. T-A-P-E-I-N-O-O. The word means to level self, and it's a command. So, when you're talking about walking in the commandments of God, which is agape, you say, do I have to study all those to do that? No, it helps you whenever you're talking to somebody, and when you need strength, and you, it's good to have information, isn't it? If you, have, if you don't have much information in Europe, and you've got some kind of, you're a computer person, and you really don't know much about it, it don't do a whole lot of good to talk to anybody, does it? If, if a new guy comes on the job and Fred's, Fred's out here and he's building something, and Fred is a great carpenter, and he's building some really nice house and beautiful ceilings and all, and some new guy comes in, he's going to know if that guy knows anything or not. It's good to know these things, but it will be going on in your heart. You will be agonizing. All of God's children are going to be agonizing. Now back over here to where we're talking about. We didn't choose God. He chose us. Why did God choose us? Because we can't choose Him. He said, you've not chosen me. I've chosen you. The main reason for believing in predestination, well, there's a couple of real good reasons. Everything that you're going through, all the fire, the trial, the persecution, we must through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of God, tribulation. And Paul said that after he was stoned and left for dead outside of Lystra. We have to go through persecution. We have to go through fire, thinking not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. That's not strange to the believer. Strange, kenizo, X-E-N-I-Z-O, is the word strange. It comes from the word X-E-N-O-S, which is the word stranger. And that's an occasional guest. He is saying, there in 1 Peter 4 and 12, the fiery trial is not an occasional guest to the believer's life. That is a daily requirement, isn't it? And when you talk truth to people, and you tell them predestination is true, the reason for understanding predestination is because nobody is good. There's none good, not one. There's none that understandeth. None seeks after God. 
Well, if nobody seeks God there in Romans 3, 3, 10 through 12, if nobody seeks God and all men drink iniquity like water and there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not and nobody's good, how's a man going to get into the kingdom? By his own will? By his choosing? You can't choose God. You can't accept Christ. That's amazing to me. All the Baptists I was ever around talk about, you've got to accept Christ as your personal Savior. No, you don't. He has to birth you with a new birth. And it won't be your will that He births you. It'll be His will. Somehow He'll cross your path with the truth. He'll cut into your heart and make you alive. Do you think you make yourself alive? Is anybody here that had anything to do with making themselves alive in their mother's womb? Somebody that helped make themselves... Anybody here that helped conceive themselves, raise your hand. You can't conceive yourself and you can't make yourself alive. We are made alive. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. Quickeneth, Z-O-O-P-O-I-E-O. Make, poeo, alive. Go to a zoo to see living animals. Make alive. That's a zoo. Next time you go to the zoo, the zoo is a Greek word. Make alive. So the Spirit makes alive. And we are set apart. He's chosen us through sanctification of the Spirit. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. 2.13. And He's going to sanctify us. The word sanctification is the word H-A-G-I-A-S-M-O-S. Hagiasmos. It is a derivation, a derivative of H-A-G-I-A-Z-O. And that's the common word, hallowed. Hallowed be thy name. It's also the common word sanctify. It means to set apart. Well, the base word is H-A-G-I-O-S, which is the word holy. Holy. Well, when the Bible says, be ye holy. By the way, there in First Peter, the first chapter, that's an imperative command. I don't know how to be holy. Well, God's going to cause you to be willing to be holy. Holy means to be single, pure. And the Scripture tells us the trying of your faith is more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried by fire. Holy has the idea of putting something in a fire, turning the heat up, and burning out all the impurities. Burning out impurities. When God puts us in the fire, the people that He foreknew, the people He foreknew, not what God foreknew, that word foreknow, prognosco. Pro is our prefix pre. It means before. And gnosko means to know intimately. No, intimately. God has a people, and they are the ones that love God. They're the ones that God has shed abroad His commandments in our hearts. They're in the fifth chapter of Romans. They're the ones that God has written His law in fleshy tables of our hearts in Second Corinthians, the third chapter. In Hebrews, the eighth chapter. Hebrews, the tenth chapter. I've written my laws in their hearts. If God writes His laws in our hearts, let me ask you something. Who's in the charge of the hand that writes? Where does the action proceed from? From you? From walking down an aisle? We don't believe in walking down aisles here. That is only about 175 years old in America, walking an aisle and trying to accept Christ. You can't accept Christ. I guess I ought to go ahead and say it. 1 Corinthians 2.14 1 Corinthians 2.14 The natural man does not receive, receiveth not, receiveth not. Receiveth is the word decomai. <clears throat> Deck is the word ten in the Greek. A decade is ten years. You know, this is so simple. I put this on the board so many times. 
And that's like falling off a log, isn't it? If you can't understand this, you're very stupid. <laughs> it doesn't take a genius to understand. Decomai comes from the word deck, which is the word ten. And a decade is ten years in a decalogue. Decalogue is the ten logos or ten commandments. Ten logos. Decalogue is ten commandments. Decomai means to reach out to ten fingers and accept an offer that's been presented. Dead man, the Bible says, the natural man, the sukikos, the man of the senses, the physical man, does not accept anything spiritual. There's no such thing as accept Christ. And the Scripture tells us in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, that God scourges every son He receives. And that word receive in Hebrews 12 is the word decomai. He does the accepting, we don't. Why preachers have missed this is beyond me. Why my father missed it is beyond me. Of course, my father didn't know the first meaning of the Greek language. He knew nothing about it. Do I believe people need to study the Greek? Well, certainly I do. And do we study it here? The average person here knows more Greek than most professors out here at these Bible colleges in Tennessee. Did you know that? The average person here knows more Greek. Well, Jim, I can't understand that. Well, certainly you can. That Truck drivers understand it. How much education have you had, Gerald? Sixth grade. Sixth grade. And Gerald understands exactly what I'm saying, don't you? Understands exactly. I mean, there's people here that don't have lots of education. They can understand this because our language comes from there. Their alphabet is basically ours. So we are set apart through sanctification of the Spirit, and the Bible says the Spirit is the truth. Now here's, we're sanctified by the truth. Truth is the word aletheia. It, now here's what sanctifies you when you tell people the truth. The word truth comes from lanthano, which means to lie hid. Now, here's what will sanctify you. When you place the alpha as a negative particle in front of a word, it negates the word, gives an opposite meaning. Placing the alpha in front of lanthano translates aletheia, or truth. It means not to hide anything. When you define the words and conjugate the verbs and say, here's the predicate, here's the noun, here's the direct object, this is the meaning of the word in the first century. When you do this, this is pulling the cover off the truth and you'll be sanctified because you'll go through the fire after so many years of the fire, you surrender and say, Lord, I give up. I'm going to serve you. I don't care what people say or do. I'm really not interested in what people say about me. My father didn't like this message. My mother didn't like it. And she played piano for him for 55 years in Oregon. <laughs> That's for her benefit. <clears throat> And my mother didn't like it. And my brothers and sisters all got saved. You don't get saved. There's no such thing as get saved. I hate that. Did you get saved? He got saved. Now get. That's what John Wayne says. <laughs> saved is the word sozo. Sozo means to be taken from one point all the way to another point through all kinds of fire and persecution that is sanctifying you and causing you to give up that outer man. you got an inner man and an outer man, and the outer man there in Romans 7 wants to serve the law of the flesh, and the inner man is Christ in you, and he serves the law of God. And over the years, through trial and tribulation and fire and persecution and all of this, God is going to sanctify this outer man and cause this outer man to die to the flesh. And that don't happen one day, does it? And I don't know preachers that even believe this. You have, you have to give up self, but you can't. You have to believe God, but you can't. But you have to believe God, but you can't. But you have to, but you can't. What are you going to do? You don't do nothing. God, if you belong to God and you're one of God's predestinated elect family, you're one of the ones He foreknew, and He's predestined you to something. 
And that something has to do has to do with being sanctified by the Spirit and believing this truth. And belief, belief, belief is the word P-I-S-T-E-U-O and faith is the word P-I-S-T-I-S and they're the same word, they have the same stem. This is believe, this is faith. Faith is the noun, believe is the verb. So everything that faith is, believe is. And faith cometh by hearing. Here's the word akuo. A-K-O-U-O. And obey is the word hoop. A-K-O-U-O. In the Greek. And the word obey means to hear under or be subordinate to. It means... You have to obey God to believe Him. You don't believe something and not obey it, do you? If you actually believe that putting sugar in a banana pie, or putting salt in a banana pie, how, well, how much does that need? Oh, it needs a cup of sugar. Well, that salt looks like sugar. Let's put that in there. Do you actually believe it's going to make it taste good? You don't ever put salt in there, do you? No. You don't say, well, it looks the same. What difference does it make? Oh, uh, when you taste, it's going to make a difference, isn't it? You know, that is, this is so simple when it comes to doing what you believe. I've learned this a long time ago. People believe what they do and do what they believe. They may say, oh, I really want to be a part of grace and truth and believe this predestination. No, you don't if you're not here. And I don't believe you're supposed to be here until God brings you. I'm not going to try to bring you. I've even told one fellow over at Willie's house one day, I said, we're not going to ask you back if you come to church. We don't believe in asking you back. And I told Willie, I should have said, we don't even want you back. And if he believes he's supposed to be back, he'll come whether I want him back or not. Isn't that true? Next time you're talking to somebody, say, we don't want you to come to our church. We preach predestination and Christmas is pagan and God doesn't love everybody. And they're going to say, what do you mean you don't want to come? We only want you to come if God wants you to, but I don't want you to. Do you know that you can't keep a person away from the truth if they're a believer? You can't. The truth is too interesting. Reading a Bible, reading an English Bible, the way these preachers read it is boring because they don't make anything mean anything. Now, we're predestined to something. This inner man is going to make the outer man die over years of fire and trials. Now, we're predestined. The people that God foreknew, He's predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. That's the truth. That's Bible. People don't have to believe it. I've had people say, I don't like that predestination. It means something else. No, it doesn't. It means exactly what it says in the Greek text. New Testament was written in Greek. English is around 11 to 1,200 years old. English is only about 1,200 years old. How old is the Greek? 2,800 years in the developing. What were they speaking in the first century? Everyone was speaking some form of the Greek K-O-I-N-E. Koine is the word common. They had a common street language in every city-state, and those Koine would differ as much as two foreign languages in our day and time. That's why there were all those gathered at Jerusalem, and they all spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Other tongue is the word heteroglossa. Heteroglossa. These were Jews from every nation under heaven, and they had been scattered in 722 B.C. Northern Israel, 586 B.C. And they'd been scattered all over the earth. Uh, southern Judah, or southern Israel, southern Israel, northern Israel in 722. So when they come back to Jerusalem, they're all speaking in these glossa or foreign languages, and hetero means other. A heterosexual is other sex. Hetero, by the way, is a Greek word. So they all spoke with heteroglossa, and when they heard them speak in their own tongue, the word is dialectos. And each one of those koine in every city-state was called a dialect of the 
Greek. And they all spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And the word utterance doesn't mean to make guttural sounds. Utterance is the word apo, A-P-O-P-H-T-H-E-G-G-O-M-A-I. It means to speak so clearly as to be easily understood. That's what utterance means. It doesn't mean gobbledy 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 shandala mangala shandai. You say, Jim, why do you make fun of those people? The same reason Elijah made fun of the priests of Baal there in the 18th chapter of 1 Kings. Maybe your God is asleep. If you yell louder, you can wake him up. They're offering sacrifices to Baal, the sun god, and jumping up and down on the altar and cutting themselves. And Elijah says, well, maybe he's on a journey. Perhaps he's talking to another god. People say, you shouldn't make fun of preachers. Kenneth Copeland is an out-and-out out liar. The man's going to be in hell one day telling people God wants everybody rich. I believe that I would go to Bangladesh. I walk the streets of Bangladesh and tell everybody, all you got to do is say it with your mouth and you can have a new Cadillac next week. I believe that. Those guys are liars. They're going to be in hell one day. They are those people that will say, Lord, Lord, heaven, we prophesy in thy name, and thy name cast out devils. And Jesus will say, Depart me that work iniquity. I never gnosko you. I never knew you. That's the same word as prognosko. God has a family that he before knew intimately, but he's going to tell those that say, Have we done all these things for you? I never knew you. You were never a part of my family. So the people that God foreknew, he's predestined. Prohorizo. That's the word predestinate. <laughs> I've had people say, I'm sure a lot of you people had the same thing. Well, predestination has got just such a cloudy meaning. and It just doesn't really mean what it says. And we need some great scholarly teacher uh, to explain to us what that means. No, we don't. All you have to do is look up the word. It's pro horizo. Pro means before. Horizo. Pro means before. And there's the little diacritical mark, the breathing sound, the eight sound, to before horizo, which means to bound. And later on, the Latins put an N on that. It means to bound inside the horizon or inside the light. So God's people have been bound beforehand inside the light. The light is truth. And Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the light of the world. So we have been predetermined for Jesus. And the people he foreknew, he's predestined to be conformed to the image. Our predestination is towards the image, towards the icon or the likeness of Jesus. In your life, you're going to have to go through fire and trials and persecution and tribulation if you belong to God before the foundation of the world. He had chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we be holy and without blame. So He's chosen us before the world began and the ones that He foreknew, prognosco, He knew us beforehand in His mind we didn't exist before the world, but we existed in the mind of God. He knew exactly who we were. And He arranged our life to come across truth. And He's going to conform us, sumorphos. He's going to shape us in fellowship. It takes the fellowship. Sum means to synthesize together. We get the word sin, from S-Y-N, from sum. That is an English sin that comes from sum. And when we synthesize, sum means with or to blend together. Morphe means to be shaped. Morphe means to shape. We're going to be shaped into the likeness of Jesus by the fire and the trials of life. And somewhere along the way, as a believer, you have to be developing. When God arranges your life and your, 
you hear the word of the gospel either through a book or a Bible or a preacher or something, even a false teacher can quote the Bible and you can get convicted from that. Even a man that's going to die and go to hell one day because Satan knew the Scripture, didn't he? He told Jesus in Luke 4 and Matthew 4, Cast yourself down. Isn't it written in the 91st chapter of Psalms that the angels will bear thee up in their hands lest thou dash thy foot against a stone? Satan quotes the Bible verbatim. And it's the Word of God that will not return void even when a false teacher reads something out of the Scripture. And then he starts perverting it. Now, what is it that causes us to conform? It's the fire. It's the trial. We've been talking about some words. We've been talking about God perfecting us. And when you find this word perfect, it does not mean without sin or flawless. When Jesus would say things like, Be therefore perfect. Even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Be ye is future tense. Be ye. Over there, back over there in Matthew, the, the fifth chapter, fifth chapter, verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect. Be ye is the word S-S-T-H-E. E-S-E-S-T-H-E. Essay is the word be ye. It is future tense. And Jesus is talking to the blessed ones on the mountain. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Chapter 5, Matthew 5, 6 and 7. This is what we call the Sermon on the Mount. It's Jesus' first message. And he's talking to the blessed ones in chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God was a term for Israel or the church. He says, blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek. They'll inherit the earth. And so forth. Well, when he gets over here, he's still talking to the same people. He's saying, you're baby believers. This is my first message. And I've gathered the people on a mountain here. And I'm telling you, you're going to have to, in the future, you're going to have to go through fire and trials and you'll have to become like Jesus because that's what you are predestined to, like Jesus. People don't like the idea that man doesn't have a will to come to God and he doesn't have a will to do right. He don't even have a will when he's a believer to do right. Paul said, how to perform, Romans 7:18. How to perform that which is good, I don't find in me. Performed is the word katergazoma, K-A-T-E-R-G-A-Z-O-M-A-I. Katergazoma means to work, ergon. This is a part of that word there, ergon. Ergazo is the verb form of ergon, which means to toil. And kata means with great intensity. Paul said, I do not know how to work righteousness in me. I don't know how to do it. Because he said, there's nothing good in me. And if anything happens in me, it will be God that works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. It will be God that's causing you to be willing to live righteously and godly. I don't hear people talking about living righteously and godly. Do you? And giving up self. Has everybody given up self? Has nobody gotten mad this week at nobody else? Huh? Has anybody gotten mad in traffic? Huh? Did you get mad for somebody cheating you and beating you out of something? When you can, folks. Some guy you bought a car, bought some insurance, or sold your house, and they cheated you, and they listed the house too low, and they beat you out of 10000 Has anybody gone through anything like that besides me? Has anybody got angry in their life? The longer you live, the more you're going to learn to rest that even all of these evil things are of God. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Isn't this amazing? I'm quoting out of a King James Bible. This is verbatim King James. It's not even New King James. 
Do you hear people quoting these verses? You hear anybody talking about, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you're going to live godly, you have to suffer persecution. I've never heard any preacher say to a congregation, he that beareth not his cross and followeth after me cannot be my disciple. I've never heard a preacher say, if you don't have a daily cross, you can't be a disciple of Christ and go to heaven when you die. You can't. Where do you get a cross? Well, you get a cross from telling the truth. And men will crucify you for telling them, for quoting Romans 8, 29 verbatim, won't they? They get bent. And that's an idiom. <laughs> don't they? Don't you tell me that God's predestined. I don't like that. And I think everybody's got a chance. What do you mean chance? You mean when, I, when there's none good and none righteous and none calleth upon thy name, there's none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. Nobody calls on God when they're dead in sin. Stirreth up is the word ur, U-W-R. Nobody calls on God to wake himself from the dead. Call on God. Ur, stirreth up is the word ur. This is Isaiah 40, 64 and 7. Isaiah 64 and 7. I, I haven't really explained this thoroughly. Nobody calls upon God, yet the world says you've got to pray a sinner's prayer, don't they? And they say if you pray the sinner's prayer, that'll wake you up from the dead. Don't they say that? Or means to wake from the dead. From dead. And the world says you're dead and sin out here, and the way you become undead is pray a sinner's prayer. You know what they say? And the Bible says, there's none that calls upon God or prays a sinner's prayer to wake himself from the dead to get himself saved. It's not true. Well, yeah, but the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It certainly does say that. Gosh, I guess I better throw everything out I've already said, huh? Yes, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But the next verse says, How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? Isn't belief the method of salvation? What did Paul tell the Philippian jailer in Acts the 16th chapter? The Philippian jailer asked the perennial question that's asked by all men in the world. What must I do to be saved? And Paul knelt down by him and said, Would you like to accept Christ as your personal Savior? Would you pray this prayer and mean it with all your heart? He didn't say that. He said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But belief is obedience. And you can't believe, but you have to. But you can't, but you have to. Where are you going to get belief? Faith or belief is the gift of God. He has to put it in our hearts. That makes sense to me. And why it don't make sense to these free will preachers? I don't know. Now. So when he says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. That word perfect is the word teleos. Now we've got, I've gone through this, and I've got some new things to give you on this. That's the word teleos. T-E-L. T-E-L. I-O-S. Now, this word teleos, T-E-L-E-I-O-S, excuse me, it means to be of full age, to be a grown man. It's the same word that's used when the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14 and 20, in understanding be men, be teleos. The word men and the word perfect there in Matthew, the fifth chapter, and verse 48 are the same word. Same word. And when he says there in Hebrews 5.14, he says, strong meat, stereos. Looks like stereos. 
Stereos means stiff. It means beef, steak. Belongs to those who are of full age. That means grown up. You don't take a baby that's three years old or even two and a half and feed them a filet mignon. You don't feed them a ribeye. It's got too much fat and gristle on it. You don't do that. If you do, you really got to cut up in little bitty tiny pieces. Full age, perfect there in Matthew 5, and men, in understanding be men, over there in 1 Corinthians 14 and 20, they're all the same word. Men, full age, so when we're predestined to be like Christ, we're predestined to be perfect. And we've said that you've got these words, teleos, teleotes. Let me write these down again. These are the different words, teleos, T-E-L-E-I-O-S. And of course, that means to be complete or full age or to be a man, be grown up. This is, this is a... That is a synonym. Synonym means a word that means the same thing. Sin means with. Uh, This is a synonym to the word arete. Remember the word arete? Besides all this, give all diligence. There in 2 Peter 1 and 5. Give all diligence. Add to your faith. And what's the first thing he says? Does anybody remember? Huh? Virtue. Virtue is the word rete. It means manly. Our manliness. Our grown up. He's saying, become a man. You start off as babes in Christ. Nobody is born again mature. Nobody. I've got all these verses on being a baby. Uh, when he speaks of God hath not re- God hath revealed these to babes, nepios, N E P I O S, N E P I O S is the word babe. It's also the word children, N E P I O S. It's a babe, or children, or child. When you when you look at uh, he speaks of out of the mouth of babes in Matthew twenty one sixteen. God hath revealed them unto babes. God hath kept these things secret from the world and revealed them to nepios. And the Bible speaks of us as Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 3 and 1. He said, I need to feed you with meat, but you're not able to bear the meat because you're babes in Christ. Did Corinth have a problem with the Scripture? More than as much as any church in the Scriptures. People say, I don't want to go to a church that has arguments and fusses. Then you don't want to go to Corinth. You don't want to go to Galatia. You don't want to go to Philippi. You don't want to go to Thessalonica. You don't want to go to Ephesus. You don't want to go to Colossia. That's all they had was problems. What do you think Paul wrote those letters for? Then you have the word teleio or teleotes, T E. L-E-I-O-T-E-S. That word in Hebrews 6 and 1. 6 and 1. When Paul says, Let us lay aside all these basics of the doctrines of faith and let us go on unto perfection or let us go on to the image, the icon, or the likeness of Jesus. Isn't that what he's saying? Because that's what I predestined you to. And you have the words... He uses this nearly every time you find the word perfect or perfected or perfected. Excuse me, I'm jumping ahead of myself. This word here, under here, is this word T-E-L-E-I-O-O, teleio. And it means to accomplish To bring to completion. Bring bring to completion. Remember we said saved 
saved was taken all the way from one point all the way to another point. And you find the very definition of that in Philippians 1 and 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he that hath begun. Jesus began it. You didn't begin it by accepting Christ and walking down an aisle and praying a sinner's prayer. We know that God heareth not sinners. If any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. You have to be worshiping God and doing his will before he ever listen to you. Why would a man who don't believe God start praying to God he don't believe in? Don't even make sense, does it? You don't pray to a... I'm not going to pray to Zeus any moment here. I'm not going to pray to Mithra. Why do you think I'm not going to pray to him? I don't believe they're there. Why would a man start praying to God he didn't believe in? Why would there be such a thing as a sinner's prayer? Sinner's prayer and accept Christ. I grew up in a Baptist preacher's home hearing that all my life, begging people down and out, and it's absolutely not true. If I'm going to call my own father down, and I did before he died, I'm not going to spare Billy Graham. I'm not going to spare Charles Stanley. I'm not going to spare... David Jeremiah, one of the boorish men alive. How those people get by with this. I told my son Eric, I said, well, I don't know why God don't kill those people. He said, maybe he's reserving them for judgment. I said, maybe. I don't know how Billy Graham gets by with what he's saying. And that'll make people so mad when you say Billy Graham is a false teacher. Billy Graham is absolutely a false teacher. He preaches, accept Christ and pray the sinner's prayer. And he preaches free will. Doesn't he? The hardest thing in the world to do is look at a real nice guy and admit that he is what he is. <coughs> Billy Graham's a nice guy. He'd probably be real nice to have living next door to you. Probably never would steal from you. But if you talk to him over the fence, he'd lie to you and tell you you had to accept Christ. Wouldn't he? It's not true. He is the most popular preacher in the last 2,000 years among secular preachers, isn't he? He was drawing bigger crowds than all these charismatics in 1952 and 53, filling up stadiums when I was a boy. Is he popular in the world? On the top of the charts, on the top of the polls for the last 60 years. Well... The Bible says that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. I believe Billy Graham stinks in the nostrils of God. Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. Woe is a cry of damnation. It's the word ooai, O-U-A-I. There's a cry of damnation against a man that all the world likes. Does the world like Billy Graham? I keep saying he's just like Sarah Lee. Nobody doesn't like Billy Graham, except me. If you study the text and you study the meaning of the words, you're going to find out we're living in the apostasy and we're being lied to on every hand from all these churches. Well, who do you believe in, Jim? I don't believe in a preacher that I know of. Not one. They don't know anything. I've spent nearly 60 years studying Scripture. Preachers don't know anything. I am sick of them. And to say that Kenneth Copeland doesn't know nothing, that man is plunging into hell right now. And T.D. Jakes and Creflo Dollar, he got the right name, doesn't he? Dollar. We have to, we're being accomplished. And every time the Bible uses, perp, every time you see this word teleo, it's being perfected, it's, it's how that we're being perfected. You have the word teleosis, T-E-L-E-I-O-S-I-S. Teleosis means performance. It's not something that happens one day. That's the whole point. It's a performance of God in our lives, the whom's that He foreknew. He is perfecting us through fire. This is the performance of God. He that hath begun the good work will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. By the way, that word performance, epi, T-E-L-E-O, epi, teleo. That's the word performance to superimpose 
the perfection or the completion of God upon our lives as He is saving us as His elect family. And that's the truth. I don't mind facing these guys out in public. I don't mind facing Billy Graham. The man is so ignorant. I mean, just ignorant. Does it bother you that you listen and respect people out here that are ignorant? You want somebody building your house and you never built a house before? Is that what you want? He don't know what a level is. He don't even know how to pick up a hammer and drive a nail. It must be talking about me. You want me building your house? Next time you get ready to build a house, come to me. I'll build you one. It won't be very nice. I'm the wrong guy to get to build you a house. And let me tell you, Billy Graham is the wrong man to listen to when it comes to salvation. I don't know how in the world that man's going to get into heaven. Yeah, but he's preached to all these people in the world. Yes, and he said nothing to them. He's lied. He's popular, is it? Is Billy Graham a friend of the world? Everybody likes him. The Dalai Lama likes him. Did you know that? He's met with the Dalai Lama, the head of the Buddhist religion in Tibet. He meets with the Pope. The Pope loves him. All the Popes liked him. The adulterers and adulteresses know you not that friendship with the world is enmity against God and whosoever will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Enmity is the word ekthra. Hostile. If you like everybody in the world and they all like you and you always got a smile on your face and you're a real nice guy, God is your enemy. God's enemies don't come breathing fire and, and have horns that coming out of their head. God's enemies comes looking like Jesus, the other Jesus, the other spirit, the other gospel that Paul spoke of in the 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians. Now, I want to give you some other things about this word teleos. You have the word telos, means to complete. And all of these come from completion. It has to do with us conforming to the likeness of the icon of Jesus, isn't it? People say, who do you think you are? I don't think I'm anybody. Do you know what God had to do to me to cause me to be willing to preach this? God nearly killed me. Put me in a hospital several times. I was dying. I said, Lord, I give up. I've had too many young guys come through here and say, well, I think it's time for me to preach. And if I'm not me a preacher, what do you think? I say, no. God had to convince me to do this. They, I've had one fellow stood there in the back and told Marianne, said, she was, he pointed up the pulpit to me and said, I want to be in his place. Well, now he's an agnostic. You don't believe God anymore. <laughs> you have to be convinced by God to preach this because this makes lots of enemies, doesn't it? Everybody here that witnesses, I witness every day, everywhere I go. I don't know who the elect are. And I witness everybody. I witness to waitresses and witness down here at, at Publix and at, down at Kroger's and the supermarkets and down the service station wherever I go I carry I carry DVDs in my pocket and I hand them out to people and say listen to this you're going to hear stuff you've never heard before I've had people say oh I probably heard it I said no you hadn't no you haven't well does anybody agree with you yeah there's a lot of guys agree with me they're all dead I mean Thomas Watson agreed with me and he Died 300 years ago. Me and him would have been real good friends. I would have loved John Bunyan. John Bunyan wrote probably the most famous book out of the Bible that's been written in the last 2,000 years. He wrote Pilgrim's Progress. And John Bunyan spent 12 years in prison for preaching what I preach here. Christmas is pagan. Easter is pagan. God doesn't love everybody. He loved his wife, the church, and died for her. That's it. He knew. Do you think Jesus knew who he was dying for when he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world? Did he have any idea who he's dying for? He's dying for his wife, the church. That's all he died for. If he died for the man in hell, what's the man doing in hell? That is just, you know what, that is not even advanced mathematics. That's about fourth grade arithmetic. If he died for everybody, then the man in hell doesn't mean to be dying for his own sin. You say, well, death is 
No, death means separation, not annihilation. That's the word thanatos. Is the man in hell being separated from God forever? Yes, he is. Is he conscious of what's going on? Yes, he is. I preached on hell here a couple of weeks ago. That man in the 16th chapter of Luke. Now, let me give you... I'm going to give you something else concerning this word. I've been teaching through the Old Testament on Wednesday night. I've hit something that's amazing. I've been looking at the breastplate. Let me... All right been looking at the breastplate of the ephod. Now I'm going to see if I can give this to you. All right. It has to do with this right here, teleos, teleotes. It has to do with this. The priest there, God tells the priest to build the breastplate for to, build an, to make an ephod. Ephod was like, this is what the high priest wore. Ephod was kind of like a poncho. And it was like this. And on the front of the, on the front of the ephod that the priest wore was a breastplate. And it had 12 stones in it had one for each of the tribes of Israel and had the names of one, each one of the tribes. And inside the breastplate was the... It had an empty place inside of it. It was like a, like a box inside the breastplate. And they kept the Urim and the Thummim. inside the breastplate. And if the priest of God had the Urim and the Thummim inside there when he prayed to God and he was obedient to God, God would answer every prayer. But he never prayed for himself. He prayed that God would destroy the enemies. The Urim and the Thummim are probably, along with the, along with the, in the New Testament, along with the spirits in prison, when you start studying these things, spirits in prison, or you study the Urim and the Thummim in the Old Testament, it's supposed to be one of the most confusing things to people. They don't know what Urim and Thummim is. It's an amazing thing. In the Septuagint, when you see LXX, LXX, that's 70 in Roman numerals. Roman numerals. It took 70 men to translate the Hebrew text to Greek, to Greek, and this was done in around 200 B.C. Now, the reason they translated the Hebrew text to Greek is because Alexander the Great took over the world around 332 B.C., and he gave all the world, all of its glossa that we talked about a while ago, glossa, foreign languages. Glossary is a section of a book with words that are foreign to the average reader. And it means foreign language. And Alexander the Great gave them all of their glossa and all of their dialectos, which was a dialect of the Greek language. So they saw fit around 200 since the world was all speaking some form of the dialects at every city state. If you went up here to, if you left Jerusalem, you went up here to what we call Lebanon or what is Tyre and Sidon of the ancient world, they spoke a different dialect of the Greek Koine. In fact, they spoke a different dialect in northern Israel than they did in southern Judah. You remember when Peter stood before the fire and he was warming his hands before the fire 
And she and the woman that come up, and she said, "Are you with this man, this Jesus that they've taken?" He swore and said, "No, I'm not with him." But she said, "But your speech betrayeth you. You're from Galilee, aren't you?" She knew. She knew about the dialect. So they saw fit around 200 B.C. All the world was speaking some form of the dialect. And all the world doing this, they said, we've got to translate the Hebrew and this Septuagint. This Septuagint was considered the most accurate of all translations. It's even considered today the most accurate of all translations of any part of the Bible. That's why we go into the Greek text and find out what the words mean. They don't mean what the preachers are saying. Prayer don't mean to ask God for what you want and get it. It means to bow to the will of God. Prosukamah is the word. And we're to pray thy will be done, aren't we? And Jesus prayed thy will be done and that's what we pray and that's what it means. Don't mean God I love you. Give me a car and give me a house. Let me make $50 an hour. I love you. Amen. I'm sorry, but that ain't what it means. That's just wishing. Now, all right. So the Septuagint, when they translated the words upright. Gosh, I've got so much on this. When they translated the words upright, Upright in the Hebrew, who's going to inherit God's holy hill in Psalms 15 and 1? Those who walk uprightly. The word is T-A-M-I-Y-M. This is the word upright. It's also the word without blemish. All through the Old Testament, without blemish. And when they took this, this word tamim, Whenever you see I-Y-M on a word, it's always plural. In fact, when you see E-L-O-H-I-Y-M, when people say they don't believe in a trinity, this is the word God of the, in the Old Testament. I-Y-M is plural. God in the Old Testament is plural. There's three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. Well, I-Y-M is plural, and this word I-Y-M, upright, is plural of Tam or Tom. Now, this word Tam or Tom was translated into the Septuagint. It was always, Tomam was a form. It was translated in Teleos. Teleotes, teleosis, telos. It was always a form of perfection. But perfect not meaning flawless or without sin. And when we find the word, when you find the word thumim, it is a form of tomim. The Thummim and the... This is considered one of the most difficult things to understand throughout... Let me get my things together here. The Thummim. Let me see if I've got some things here on this. All right. Let's look at just the word Thummim, upright. Now, it may take me a couple of weeks to go through this may take me longer than that. Look over here in Exodus 28. Go to Exodus 28. Well, let me go ahead before I read this. Well, I'll read it and then I'll explain this. Exodus 28. I may bring this out again on Wednesday night. So everywhere you find upright... You find the word uprightly or thou shalt be perfect with the Lord in Deuteronomy 18, 13. 
when the Bible speaks of a full year, full, in Leviticus 23, 25, and 30, full means it's this word, tamem, which was translated into the Septuagint, teleos, or teleotes. And that's what we're predestined to be, isn't it? How many of you have heard the Urim and the Thummim? And everybody wrestles with it, don't they? The answer is in the definition. That's where it is. It's, you know where the answer is to all of this? Definition. It's like the spirits in prison. Prison, fulake, means the division of day and night and light and darkness. Fulake. Day and night are light and darkness. And boy, we have taught light and dark or day and night. And forgiveness, aphesis, means to pardon and release from prison. You were darkness, but now you light in the Lord, walk as children of light. It's not like it's hard. And the Gentiles were in prison, and when Paul would say those words, he would send to Gentile churches, and Gentiles from Adam until Jesus stayed in darkness, didn't they? They weren't allowed to have the truth. Not until Acts, the second chapter. Correct? Now, where was I? All right, two men. Look here in 28 and verse 30. 28, 30. Now, you're going to find this 28 and 30. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim, the Urim, and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart. Now, where is the law written now? In fleshy tables of our hearts? The love, the agape of God is shed abroad in our hearts. What if I said, Thou shalt... Put in the breastplate of the judgment the Urim and the Teleos, the perfect, the perfectness upon the heart of the priest. Now this word, the word Urim, comes from U R U R I M. I am is plural. It, is a, it comes from the word O-W-R, which is the word light, illuminate. So whatever the equivalent is in the New Testament text, the Urim has to do with light. And in the Old Testament, when the Bible says, let there be light, let there be light. Light, the word is or. And it comes from the word U R I M. Urim. It comes from the Urim. The word Urim comes from the word that means light. So what you've got when you've got the Urim and the Thummim, you've got light. Our illumination. Or you have Christ, which is the light of the world, and He is in us, right? And then you have, this would be the Urim. And then when you have the Thummim, you have the Amen. And every time you find the word usually upright, it's usually a form of this word, Tamem, upright. And it's translated into Septuagint, Teleos, or Teleates, or some form of this word, which means to be complete or mature. So when you're finding the Urim and the Thummim, you're finding the same thing that we're predestined to, to the righteous light and the 
uprightness of God in our hearts. And that is maturity that we are predestined to come to, isn't it? When you translate this word, this word, Urim, over to, over to the Septuagint, when you translate the Septuagint, it'll either be this word Urim, since it comes from or, or, since it comes from that, and it means light, it will either be phos, foster, phosphorus. Phosphorus is a shining element, isn't it? And that word phosphorus is the word day star. In Second Peter, the first chapter, when the day star rises in our hearts, notice the figurative language in all this, the allegorical language. Phosphorus. Phosphorus. And we get our word phosphorus from that. Phosphorus. Look over there in Second Peter. Second Peter, first chapter. Hadn't read this in a long time. Second Peter. All right. We have also a verse nineteen. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light, the phosphorus, the phos, that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the phosphorus, the day star, arise in your hearts. And what was it upon the heart of the high priest? The orim, the thumim, the uprightness. I don't know how to teach this other than to throw it at you a little bit at a time, a few little pieces here and there. So, and then you get also the word photinos, P-H-O-T-E-I-N-O-S, P-H-O-T-E-I-N-O-S. And that means something that's well illuminated. And we are well illuminated when this, when this Urim is in our hearts. Remember, everything over here is a shadow, isn't it? Everything over here is the very image, right? The law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image. The image is Christ in us. We're the body. We're the church. And over here, you have the Urim and the, tom, the, the Tomem, or the or the Thummim, which is a derivative of the word Tomem. In fact, if you look up the word Tomem in, uh, in a Englishman's concordance, which has every time the word is mentioned, they don't even mention the word Tomem alone. They put it under... They don't mention Thummim uh, by itself. They put it in the same section where Tomem is. For those of you that have an Englishman's concordance, and I'll tell you what that means later. Then you, it also comes from the word fotidzo. All of these, all of these words, they're in the same roots of words. They're all in the same morphemes. Morpheme means word shapes. And all of these are forms of the same words. And fotidzo means to shine or to brighten, illuminate. And it has to be in our hearts, doesn't it? The day star is in our hearts. The phosphorus is in our hearts. It was over the hearts of the high priest over here, wasn't it? And then you have the word fotismos. 
And we get our word photo from all of this. Or photography, where you let the light in on the... And it means illumination. And then you also have the word phano. Phano. Which means to lighten. Remember when we talked about God resists the proud? Remember that? Resist is the word anti tasami For those of you that are new here, everybody that knows what anti-tasami means, raise your hand. See, people already know most of this. It means to what? Wage war against. Make war against. Make war with. God resists the proud. The word proud is what is that word? What's the word proud? Somebody, should, I've said this a thousand times. Who? Thank you. Who parafanos? That's it. Hooperephanos is a construction of hooper, which means above. It's our word super. Superman means above man. That's what it means. It's our word super. Hooper means above, and phanos means to shine. It's this word here. A man who likes to shine above others on stage or with awards and get a lot of applause and have all the world liking him, he's at war with God. Isn't he? That's what the Bible says. There in James 4th chapter. You, you're at war with God when you like your awards and your stuff and your things and, your, and you like to shine and look fancy with your fancy car and your fancy suit. And your fancy diamond rings. Well, God says, I'm at war with you. Now, so when you find all these words, and by the way, this word phanos is a derivative of the word P-H-E-M-E, phime, which is our word fame. And a man's fame comes by what people say about him, doesn't it? And this word is derived of the word P H E M I, which means what is said. Now remember, blessed are ye when men shall reproach you. Reproach is the word aniedzo, O N E I D I Z O. That's the word reproach. It means infamous. Blessed to you when you become infamous because people hate you for this doctrine of predestination. They say these words are not necessary that we define. We don't need these words. We got English. Yeah, and English is a harlot language and it sells out the meanings, doesn't it? It's not a good language at all. It can't express much, express much of anything. Greek has length and width and great nuances, depth. And we got length and width. That's what English has got. I, I've got a paper up here. I don't know if I got it handy. But it's about why English is hard to understand. He wound the bandage around the wound. Wound and wound are spelled the same way. How are you going to know what it means if you're from China and you come here to learn English? He wound the bandage around the wound. Huh? He wound the bandage around the wound. We've, we've got a harlot language. How much time do I have, Mike? Nine minutes. Nine minutes. Let me do this. It doesn't take a genius to find this. You can't take your U volume out of here, out of McClinic and Strong, and look up Urim. And it'll tell you about the Urim and the Thummim. And that's been the great conflict. That's one of the great conflicts along with the spirits in prison. Because nobody has defined Urim and Thummim. And I've told you that I am or I Y M is always plural, isn't it? 
Let me read a little bit about the Urim and the Thummim out of McClinic and Strong's. Urim and Thummim. The anglicized form of two Hebrew words, always together, Numbers 17, 21, 1 Samuel 18, 6. And he says, uh, with reference to some obscure mode of divination in connection with a sarsodotl or religious regalia, but concerning both ancient and modern interpreters have greatly differed. But you're going to find that in the definition of the word. The latest elucidation, meaning to explain thoroughly, of the subject may be found in Strong's Tabernacle in the Wilderness. Entomological import. Etymology means the study of words. I've had people, I've told people if I could live my life over, I'd be an etymologist. I'd try to learn eight or ten or fifteen languages. The truth is in the meaning of the words. We found that out here, haven't we? It's in the definition. You leave definition, you've left the truth. Baptized does not mean to dip in water. But baptism was a death or a martyrdom in the first century. Hebrew plurals, not proper names, but appellatives, or an appellation is a title, of frequent occurrences uh, in the singular. In Urim, Hebrew scholars, with hardly an exception, have seen the plural of ur, you are, or light, or fire. They're telling us you are means light or fire. Do we have the fire in us? Do we have the light in us? Yes. The Septuagint, however, appears to have had reasons which led its authors to another rendering of that of phos or its cognates. And phos is a Greek word in the Septuagint. Phos means to shine. And phosphorus is a shining element. And he says, we have respectively plural and singular participles, photizo, in the Greek, in the Septuagint, and in the New Testament. In Aquila and Theodosian, we find the more literal photismoi, and oi, is plural. The Vulgate, following the lead of the Septuagint, but going further astray, gives doctrina in Exodus 28 and 30 and Deuteronomy 33 and 8. Omits the word in Numbers, paraphrases it by persarsidas, as the rendering of delosis. Luther gives licked. The literal English equivalent would, of course, be lights. It's the literal equivalent of the urim. Light. Or, and is that what we have in our hearts? Yeah. But the rendering in the Septuagint and Vulgate indicate a traditional belief among the Jews that the plural form, as in Elohim, which is plural, and other like words did not involve numerical plurality. Berylim, wishing to defend the Vulgate translation, suggested the derivation of Urim to teach, but to teach means to give someone the light, doesn't it? See, these two guys are disagreeing here, and they don't even understand to teach is to give the light, isn't it? If the light is in our hearts, there's not a flashlight in there, a candle burning. It's the Word that's in there, isn't it? And we've been taught. Thummim. Here also is almost a consensus as to derivation it comes from tome, meaning perfection, completeness. But the Septuagint, as before, uses the closer Greek equivalent, teleos. Well, we've been talking about teleos a long time, haven't we? The Septuagint translated these words, teleos, that have to do with the thummim and the urim, or the urim being light, the thummim being the teleos or perfection and it adheres, adheres elsewhere to aletheia truth giving perfectus 
there in like manner giving a veritas in all other passages, Aquila more accurately chooses teleotes or teleosis. What has been said as to the plural of Urim applies here also, and the singular means light. So when you're talking about the Urim and the Thummim, you're talking about the light that's in perfection in us, going through all the fire and the trials. That's what we've been predestined to, isn't it? You know that we've been predestined to the Urim and the Thummim? And that's the Old Testament and this is one of the mysteries of all the great Greek scholars teaching and all of the scholars teaching in seminaries across America. And all they got to do is go to their McClinic and Strong and pull it out. But people don't do that. Bellomines derives thummim from to be true. Well, that truth is light, isn't it? And it is perfection that we are perfected to as we go through the fire and the trials of life. By others, it has been derived from a twin on the theory that the two groups of gems, six on each side of the breastplate, was what constituted Urim and Thummim, light and perfection. They're saying that's what it means. Is God predestining us to the light, pro horizo, predetermined for the light, that will conform to the likeness of Jesus and be perfected, and that will walk in the light and in truth. And every time you find the word light, it is a derivative of one of these words here in the New Testament. Light and perfection would probably be the best English equivalent for Urim and Thummim. The Assumption of the Hindias so that the two words equal perfect illumination. The longer you live, I'm 74 and I wanted to live for myself in my 20s and my 30s. And God has beat the living tar out of me and put me through the fire and has given me a perfect illumination. You say, Gemma, do you think you have all the, everything in the Bible down? No, but I'll tell you what, I live for this book. And anybody who wants to twist this book, they're not only God's enemy, they're my enemy. His enemies are my enemies. David said, Lord, teach me to hate those that you hate with a perfect hatred. I like that. The mere phrase as such leaves it therefore uncertain whether each word by itself denoted many things of a given kind, and they're all the same thing. If it's truth in your heart, if it's light in your heart, it's the same thing. And if you're being perfected and coming to maturity, then you have perfect illumination like the priests of God in the Old Testament, don't you? I was going to wait till Wednesday night to give this to you, but I just thought maybe Sunday morning might... Huh? I couldn't help it. Like Mary said. The presence of the article and yet more of the demonstrative before each is rather in favor of distinctness. Thummim never, occur, never occurs by itself. And then he says, the mysterious words meet us for the first time as they needed no explanation in the description of the high priest apparel over the ephod. There is to be a breastplate of judgment and four rows of precious stones, each stone with the name of a tribe of Israel engraved on it, Aaron may bear them upon his heart. And are we to bear the light of God in our heart? Are you really bearing the light of God when you first come to truth? Oh, you get excited. Oh, I got saved. I, I, I got, get, got. I got saved and I'm, I'm excited and I want to go out and try to get people saved and twist their arm behind their back and get them pressed in his prayer. No, we don't believe that. I believe in preaching to people. And if they have an ear to hear, God will make them hear. The hearing ear and the seeing eye of the Lord have made even both of them. I told a guy on the phone yesterday, he called me from New York or somewhere off the TV. I said, I'm not trying to get you to believe anything. I said, if you belong to God, you will believe. If you don't, you won't. And that's not between me and you. That's between you and God. If we can learn that at Grace and Truth Ministries, God has His family chosen. He's got vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. You're not going to get a vessel of wrath to become a sheep. And God's people will hear, won't they? I'm out of time. Let's pray. Father, thank You for truth. Lord, help us to mature in the truth. Lord, like the old 
martyrs said, give us more fire. Sometimes that's what we need, more fire. So that you can purify our hearts and cause us to be holy before you. I pray for the church, the flock. Cause them to be willing to bow to you. Those that are struggling with sin. Those that are struggling with how to grow up. Cause them to be willing to be filled with the light, the illumination, with perfection, with maturity through much fire, much tribulation. Lead us to your elect. Open up many doors for the ministry. We'll give you praise for everything in Christ's name. Amen. Mercy. Broke my head.